So I know you used to work for the Angels as well, and they've uh, just had an ownership or ownership selling the team now last week. Not um, surprised, by the way. Yeah, and obviously <laughs> having two of the best players in baseball, Mike Trout and Shohei Otani. So what do you think is the future of that? And do you, can you see either of them or even both of them getting traded potentially in the offseason? We were hearing some rumblings with Otani right like at the end of the trade deadline. What do you think that will happen with the Angels? That's a good question. I was there for three months last year. Um, I think what's hurt the Angels hurts teams, even the teams that I saw up close in Miami, um, and that's organizational depth. If you don't have organizational depth, you can have the two best players in the game, and Otani and Trout, you know, I'm sure there's arguments about that, but they're, you know, in the top three or four at least. Um, You can have those players and still – lose 95 games, which I think they're kind of on target to do. You don't have organizational depth. You don't have young players that can come and plug holes, young players that have been developed that you're paying 600,000 a year for, and they're giving you, you know, a positive war and a positive uh, performance for, Uh, or you don't, you know, if you get close to a postseason, you don't have that organizational depth to trade for arms frontline players they just don't have that i mean the lineup that they've put around those guys this year has been awful um there have been guys that have struggled but they you know the some of the guys they've run out there have not been major league caliber guys day in and day out so the question is what happens now uh do they trade either of those guys it's going to be hard to trade trout because of the length of his contract and the amount of money and and the injury issues over the last couple of seasons uh, if they did trade him somewhere, the Angels are going to have to eat some money. You know, that sounds funny to say when you're trading a, a generational player in Trout. But at this stage, they're going to they would have to eat some money on that. Otani's a completely different guy. He's, he's theirs for another year. Um, but what do you do? Does does he I mean, does he want to stay there and play for a team that is doesn't have the depth organizational depth that doesn't have the blueprint right now of, of success. He doesn't know who the owner will be uh, next year. And it may not be that they don't sell the team. Uh, it, sometimes that doesn't happen quickly. It's a process. Um, the, the guy that's most likely to be traded of those two is Otani because of what he can get back for him. Uh, you don't have to send any money. Um, you could try to rebuild not just your farm system, but populate your major league team with young, ready major league players for Otani. Until they get organizational depth, pitching depth, they've got a little bit of young pitching. They just don't have enough of it. I mean, their draft last year, it's 20 rounds now in in the major league draft. They drafted 20 pitchers in 20 rounds. That's how badly they need pitching. And they did get some good arms. But as you know, with a draft, it takes two, three, four, five years before those guys are, are... you know, the ones that have made it through to the big leagues are ready to fill to fill that role. So uh, it's a tough position to be in. Otani is just, the, you know, having watched him up close, it's, it's the most unbelievable thing I think I've ever seen in sports. It's the equivalent of um, Patrick Mahomes after he leads a, a drive down for a touchdown coming in and, and playing lockdown cornerback uh, on, on, the, on the defense. Um, it, it's incredible. I mean, it just to watch him from day in his, his daily routines, he rarely hits because he has to, for his body to, and his arm to be a starting pitcher, he has to follow the starting pitcher's protocol recovery. The, the, the next two days after his start preparation for his next start. Mm. And so a lot of time he rarely ever hits on the field. He'll hit in the cage. Um, but just the physical, uh, toll, uh, a start uh, takes on uh, takes on a pitcher, and and many times he's he's throwing seven eight innings, punching out eleven twelve guys, and hitting a three run homer as the only offense mm-hmm. on, on, in games that he starts. It, it it's uh, it's really incredible uh, to to see that in person, to be close enough to to watch him, talk to people around him, talk to him, talk to the managers, coaches about how they have handled that. Uh, I don't know that you'll. Well, ever, I mean, I'm, you're probably going to see another starter who can hit that gets to be a DH, but 
but not at this level. I, I don't know that you'll ever see that. It's really incredible. We talk about baseball and these new rules and how the game has changed. We had uh, – what umpire did we have? Dale uh, – Dale Scott. Dale yeah. Scott on last week. Very, very nice guy. Great book. I, I checked out his book, and I read a little bit of his book. The man knows baseball. He really does. And we asked him the same question. With all these different rule changes, and Rob Manfred, I'm not a big fan of his. I think he's the worst commissioner in sports. I hope that in 2024, when his contract is up, Theo Epstein's the next guy to take over for him because I think the guy's a genius. But nevertheless, the, these different rule changes, and I think the shift should be taken out of baseball, and I think it's ruined the game of baseball. It would open up the offense. They don't have to cork the balls, whatever the heck they do, seam the balls, whatever the hell they do to the balls. It, it doesn't make any sense how the regular season you have <laughs> you have a, a baseball that's completely different than the playoffs. We've heard this from the pitchers. It doesn't make sense. But going back to the game, do you like these new rules? Do you think this has helped baseball? Or do you think that baseball should have kept it the way it was from the olden days? Um, there's a lot of to unpack there. First of all, one of the guys that's at the forefront of these new rules is Theo Epstein. Mm -hmm. uh, he's been a, a consultant to Major League Baseball. He's kind of the, the not all of them, but um, he, he is uh, one of the guys that has helped, you know, implement and come up with the ideas would i love to go back to the old days when i was a kid growing up in the in the bay area going to see the the world champion a's and see the giants and and all of that um yeah i'd like to do that but the game has changed so much um the the velocity of pitchers the dominance of of pitchers the strikeouts the value of the home run it's the game has changed um and I'm sure you guys, I don't know that, that ESPN Classic is around anymore, but every now and then there'll be a game on like, uh, you know, Yes Network mm -hmm. yep. uh, or SNY. It's from the 80s, right? Yep. And, and it's amazing how quickly the game moves. It's amazing how, how often the ball is in play. It's amazing how quickly the, the pitchers work. And then you transition that or uh, contra uh, contrast it to, uh, today's game or a game that you're watching, there are times where the ball's not in play for four or five minutes, where it's strikeout, walk, uh, and, and you're six minutes and the ball's not been in play. So I think the, the, the rules are necessary because the game has, has grown and was growing into, I wouldn't say it's unwatchable, but it's not as appealing as the games that we all grew up on. Well, there are some rules that I'm not a, a big fan of. There are other rules that it's like, yeah, that makes sense. The pitch clock makes a lot of sense. Having watched MLB Network AAA game last week and watched how the pitch clock, you know, because you wanted to see how does the pitch clock work and how does it. And after like the first inning, I didn't even notice it. Mm. But you did notice how quickly the pitchers worked. You did notice how quickly the hitters were in the box. And you notice how quickly the mount the, the game moved and that pitch clock isn't just pace of play it affects pitchers especially the max effort guys who you know so many guys are in that category you can't throw a pitch and then walk around the mound for 20 seconds right. gather yourself and throw another pitch 30 35 seconds after that other pitch you have it's pitch back on the mound 15 seconds later it's pitch back on the mound and you get deep in account all of a sudden you know, 98 becomes 96. The extra innings rule is one that I thought I would not like, but I will tell you as a broadcaster, having gone through some of these 18, 20 inning games and seen the, the repercussion in the clubhouse of injuries and of teams shipping out two pitchers simply because they pitched great and lasted six innings in the, in the extra innings. And now they're not useful for the next three days. So down to the minor leagues you go player loses money, player loses time. Mm. Um, nobody's in the stands. I mean, it's fun if you've stayed up to two in the morning watching, but there's nobody in the stands. There's not a lot of other people watching. I like the extra inning rule. In fact, when it first came on, I would look at my, uh, the score on my phone or my iPad to see if a game was going into extra innings because I wanted to see how the managers ran the game. I wanted to see what the managers did in extra innings. And in the first, like the first month of this rule, I'm telling you, it was the, the everybody had the same approach, still swinging for the fences. And it wasn't until like the after the first month that that all of a sudden situational hitting started to become not 
fully back into it. But there were some teams that's like, hey, put the ball in play, get them to third, get them in, let's take the run and, and try to win the game. The bigger bases, not big on that. The shift, I, I want to see the game without the extreme shifts mm. again, just to see. I like the fact that they have the minor leagues. They can test this stuff out. They can they can see what sinks or what you know stays afloat and what enhances the game. Would I like it to go back to the to the seventies and the eighties? Yeah, that was fun, but that's not what the game is right now. And 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 you can't change the players. All you can do right now is is tweak tweak the the structure and try to get speed, try to get athleticism back in the game. We really appreciate you joining us, by the way. I know you're a busy guy. Uh, We'd love to get you on again. My producer, Speedy, will definitely reach out to you again. Uh, Thank you for your time, and uh, keep doing what you're doing, man. We're a big – I'm a big fan of what you're doing. Uh, You're you're working for CBS, College Sports, MLB Network. I mean, you're all over the place. And eventually, when you become a GM or a manager – of a team, you know, you can hire us to help you out in the back ends because we would love yeah. to do that. And, you know, that's funny. I should have done this at the beginning of the show. Our <laughs> hotel room, sometimes you go to a, a city or something like that. You look out and there's the parking lot. In this hotel room, that back window back there, I opened it up when I walked in. The Alamo is sitting right there. The oh, wow. Freaking, <laughs> the freaking Alamo is there. Damn. And it's like I'm going... Damn, that's the Alamo. I mean, I've been to San Antonio before and walked by it, but now I can just walk over to my window here for the next two days and and remember the Alamo that's just like cool. that. That's really well, cool. Well, I'm sure you're 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 more uh, interested in what's going on in baseball than going yeah, to know, look, uh, look out your window. But uh, I, again, you're you're awesome. We really appreciate your time. Uh, like I said, I know you're busy. You're a busy guy, but uh, would love to get you on again. And uh, thank you. Yeah, good luck to the Yankees. I'm I'm a big Aaron Boone fan because mm. he was a Marlin. Same here. And just for a year was a really cool guy. Would love to see them have success. I'm always rooting for Stanton. And um and good luck to the Mets. I love Gary Cohen and 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 Ron and Keith. Uh that booth and um and I hope hope that I hope they meet in the World Series. How what's the show going to be like? If they're in the World Series with you two. Well, if the Mets win the World uh, Series, I actually have to get a tattoo. Uh, you know, if, <laughs> so. if, if the, it'll be if, a little bit of that. If the Mets play the Yankees in the World Series and the Yankees beat the Mets, this guy would probably jump off a plank, okay? So, <laughs> I, I, I mean, half the Mets fans here, you have no idea how much they hate the Yankee fans. They root on the Boston Red Sox when they play the Yankees. That's how much they hate the Yankees. And as a Yankee fan... <laughs> I, I could care. Listen, if the Mets win, I'm happy for them. You now, know, in my defense, though, there was no way in hell in 09 I was rooting for the Phillies. So I did root for the Yankees then. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I, I can't stand. But if you ever become a GM, you know, you know who you can call. Uh, you know, not the Ghostbusters. You can call us, and we'd love to come and work for you. I think you're a smart guy. You know the game very, very well, and you've been well, very – you do. You do. You really I, do. And, and I'm not know, blowing I, your head I, off. Just hire Errol as a GM. It'll probably be better than the Angels front probably. office. <laughs> I'll, leave, I'll, leave you, I'll leave you with this real quick one. When I was in the – I climbed through the minor leagues. Uh, I didn't go to broadcasting school or anything like that. And I was a single-A broadcaster in Spokane, Washington. And we were playing the Medford uh, A's. And I was just out of college, and I was – at, walked out of the Motel 6, which is and back then there's no Alamo outside your hotel, uh, to go for a jog. And, and a young executive uh, was walked out of the same hotel and was had his running shoes on, looked at me and said, are you going for a run? I said, yeah. And he said, well, let's go together. It was Sandy Alderson, yeah. who was the uh, at the time the young GM of the athletics, came to see his Meyer leaguers. And we went for a run through Medford, Oregon. And... Um, Kind of picked his brain and could tell he was he was going going to go on to pretty nice things. Mm. Well, we really appreciate you, and he he did he was one of the guys that created Moneyball, and uh, it definitely changed the games for the, not only for the Oakland Athletics, it helped the game and helped teams that didn't have the money really redefine uh, what an organization could do, 
even without the money of the Yankees, the Red Sox, the Mets, and the big city teams. Now all these teams have money, and they can open up their pockets. And it doesn't matter if you're from New York. It doesn't matter if you're from Kansas City. It's all about drafting and knowing what you're doing when it comes to drafting. Yep. That's indicated so, yeah. by the Orioles this yeah. year. Yeah. A payroll that is less than Max Scherzer's salary. This Absolutely. Year. Absolutely. Yeah, but do you know what they've got? They've got organizational depth now, yep. which is mm-hmm. the, that can keep them going this way. So have a good night. Good luck to both your teams. Thank, Thank you, you, Rich. We'll talk to you soon, bud. All right. Thank you.